that. Okay. Um, one of us has a double shot of espresso, and one of us has decaffeinated, and we just mixed them up right before we came out. So yeah. you'll have to tell us. Yeah. Who's got what? Um, and they'll tell us after. That's like their okay evaluation. Okay, good. Well, now you've got a little game to play tonight. Um, so, Mark. Um, many people know you, of course, as the co-founder of Devo. Um, other people know you from any of the 150 or so movies that you scored. Um, all of that is you as a musician. Tell me how you got your start as, a, as an artist. Um, Decaf. Uh, I'll try and make it as short as I can. Um, I, when I was in school, public, as a kid, there were five kids in the family. This is not an atypical story, um, but I made it all the way through second grade. I was, I was a problem kid who they would like, um, you know, they'd say things like, uh, show, tell, tell me what, read what it says on the blackboard, and I go, what's a blackboard? And everybody would laugh, and then I'd go sit in the corner again. I go, how do people know the right thing to say? And uh, they found out I was, um, I couldn't see the big E on the eye chart from about two feet away uh, at the end of second grade, so I got glasses. But it was a day where I put them on, got in a car with my dad, and we drove over this hill, and I could, for the first time, I saw the school I'd been going to. And I could not believe, it was astounding. I saw the school, I saw the woods I walked through every day on the way to school, there was a little woods. I saw houses with roofs and tree top. I saw treetops. Um, I saw smoke coming out of chimneys. I saw birds in the sky. And I saw the sun and clouds for the first time. And I thought, this is incredible. And I was really impressed by it. And um, the next day, I was drawing trees because I'd seen pictures of them before, but I'd never really seen what the top of a real tree looked like. And um, the teacher that had been um, spanking me putting me in the corner, sending me to the office, said, Mrs. Savory, in case any of you know her, <laughs> she said, you draw trees better than me. It was, you know, and it's like, it was that little thing that, that a, a teacher said, or, or an adult said, you know, just at the right moment in, in my life, and I went home and I dreamt I was gonna be an artist. And that's how it happened. Oh. Um, so you arrived um, as an art student at Kent State uh, in 1968. And of course, um, everybody knows what Kent State is famous for. And, you know, May 4th, 1970, um, the National Guard opened fire on student protesters and, and killed four of them, creating, you know, one of the great tragedies, I think, in American history. Um, and that's where the idea of de-evolution began for you and the group of students that you were friends with, other artists and um, in your cohort at the time. Um, the world is not evolving, it is devolving, you guys sort of came to conclude. And so how did that idea of de-evolution impact you as, as an artist? It gave us a vehicle. It gave us a way to talk about our perceptions of the world and what we were observing going on around us. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, we, we grew up in a city where two of, the, uh, two of the, at the time, the most famous televangelists were broadcasting from. So, you know, we, we were well aware of religion of all different kinds. and and um, the showmanship of it and everything. But, but we thought, de-evolution, that could be the missing link between science and religion. And we, we, lo we love that idea that, that there was um, another possibility that wasn't any more provable than any of the other ones. So, so um, we went with it. Um, that's good. I think, um, uh, so in the in the mid seventies, then um, you so you, you left Kent um, around seventy two. Mid seventies, you're doing things like okay, 
let's say 75, you write and illustrate a 300 page book, My Struggle, Boogie Boy. Um, you are publishing lyrics and your writings and illustrations in a poetry journal, Shelley's. Um, you had a gallery exhibition of your sort of postcard prints and other works um, in you know Ohio at the time. You um, are working with Devo. You produce a, a film. In the beginning was the end. The truth about devolution, which wins the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Um, how did you at the time tie all of that together? Um. We were art students. Uh, Jerry Casale, who I started Devo with, we thought, we, we loved everything that was going on in Europe between World War I and World War II, the different art movements. We, we were fascinated by Dadaists, uh, Bauhaus, everything, you know, ballet, mechanique. There were so many, we thought, that's the place I wish we could have could have grown up because we felt like by being in Akron, Ohio, we were in like a cultural wasteland. But we, but at the same time, we're we're looking at, at what was going on. You know, computers hadn't really, they weren't really making art on computers yet. Nobody wa it wasn't really around yet. But but we were looking at people like Andy Warhol and and the Dadaists and we're, and the pop artists and and we thought Andy Warhol that we kind of wanted to emulate that we thought oh he's a printer a photographer a painter um a filmmaker fashion designer he throws the best parties in manhattan and he has something to do with the velvet underground i wasn't sure what but i know he did the best album cover that ever there was and uh so we thought well we're gonna we're gonna be art devo and we're gonna be an art movement in akron ohio and we're gonna, but we're going to have a factory of our own. We're going to have a factory like and Andy, but ours is a r real factory in a real factory town, you know, so ours is the real thing. And, and you know, so we, were, we wanted to work in all mediums, and we were trying to figure out ways to do things like, how could we get on a... What was that, for, the fourth station? You had your three networks, and then there was the public access station. I think probably just about everywhere. Here you had stuff like like the really crazy stuff like the blue stations blue show oh, i forget what the name of that was yeah and um but we had just you know like it was just kind of a waste that channel and we thought well we want to we want to take over that network and we'd have it a, a de-evolutionary re-education channel you know and and um instead of doing those silly dances people were doing out there we were going to have them doing like organized you know, like calisthenic dances, you know, uh, to, to Devo music, and we'd be playing B stiff, and everybody would be out there doing it, and, and um, they would be choosing their mutations carefully and on purpose. Um, so that's a, that's a phrase that you use a lot, uh, especially with Devo. Can you, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, in uh, a devolving world, things are falling apart. And, um, you know, there's all these things that are coming at you, and um, there's things that people are selling you and trying to convince you into believing in. And we were just trying to encourage people to think for themselves and to make conscious decisions about what things they were going to let come their way. Does that make sense? Uh, that's all right. Not really. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, it's, it kind of makes sense, but, but maybe I can push you a little further on that because I mean, it, it seems to me that one thing that you you are always interested is you're always interested in the mutants, right? Like your alter ego, your alter ego, your lifelong alter ego um, is this character Boogie Boy, this grotesque man-child sort of grotesque <laughs> <laughs> he was cute yeah. he was a rubber baby's mask does anyone have a copy of the book <laughs> okay oh, he's all right cute. i guess um like a parent uh, always finds their a child cute or, um, <laughs> like, um but uh <laughs> but so you have this like full head mask that you you know that you, that you would wear and this sort of it's sort of this neither adult nor child but something in between um and 
it seems the way I would sort of always think about the sort of your interest in the mutants is that like yes, yes, evolution always has a tendency towards producing um, sort of a certain logic, right? Evolution has a sort of order to it, but then the mutant is the one who creates the possibility of a new pathway, I and mean, that cr that's sort of f freedom, and that's always, and and so your role in Devo um, as this sort of as the as the mutant as the man child was that connected to some sense of creativity or freedom yeah you know uh <laughs> you know i i um can i talk about yeah, you're you're on. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, yeah. You're, um, you're the genius before there was a devo um i got talked into going to uh, a dinner um i knew it was going to be a church dinner and it was at a at the Steelworkers Union in Cleveland, and there was like 300 people there. And uh, they told me the name of the church, and I it meant nothing to me that it was called Full Gospel Church until we ate the dinner. And then afterwards, somebody got up and they started talking about Jesus Christ, and he was coming back. And about two minutes into it, he started speaking in some language that was not a human language it was something from outer space or somewhere else i don't know where it was from and it made the hair on my arm stick up and i was like holy moses what's this and then and then somebody as soon as he sat down somebody else jumped up and they spoke something in english that was you know in the same vein as as the first story and then he sat down and somebody jumped up and interpreted it and there it was like he would say and the Lord will be returning soon and sit down and then somebody else jumped up somewhere else in the room and they would go and it was like it was like incredible it was like it was this most incredible thing that had ever happened in a in a deprived uh, 19 year old kid's life and um, and I had played organ in my family's church, so I kind of had some, there was nothing like that. In the church I went to, they just got up and they, they didn't think dancing was a good thing to do, and they just talked about the virtues of work every week. And we sat on hard benches and heard we should go back to the rubber factories tomorrow and work just a little bit harder. And um, so it was totally different than that church, and I was like, what is what are they doing and, he, and they did it for like a good half hour or 40 minutes before they broke us into groups and it you know we we were like with monitors we had to each take our turn and uh they it, it got to me i i i, I wasn't sure how to speak in tongues so i just went yabba dabba doo yabba dabba doo and they kind of let me go and and uh went on to the next person but it it, it was really impressive to me and i was thinking who, where does that come from? That's something so amazing. I was really impressed and I mean, you know, I, I learned afterwards it was, you know, the importance of faith over intellect, which kind of in a way segued with de-evolution and, you know, the concept that man's intellect is what creates all the problems we have and what, what is really causing our de-evolution, that it's not really causing an evolution. So there's this, there was other things that it kind of ended up later on being tangential with. And, um, but I just remember thinking, where, who was that talking? And I, so I started paying attention to homeless people after that, and I'd listen to what they were saying, and you know, and I could never decipher it, you know, or like figure out exactly what they meant. So I wasn't part of that group, but I was wondering, is this the other ninety percent of the brain that that the ten percent that we're using as babysitting is is the other ninety percent like? doing all these really great things and we don't even get to know about it because we're like we're like hooked up to the 10 percent that's like the nanny that just has to like make sure we uh you know flush the toilet and um, put on our clothes before we go to work and uh um, pay our rent and and does all the really boring parts of life maybe this other 90 percent is something truly amazing and so boogie boy to make a short story even longer boogie boy um we Early in the 70s, um, uh, we couldn't afford drugs in Ohio. Uh, uh, we, we, nobody owned a van, and um, none of us liked the bowl, so we really didn't fit in to Akron. But we liked rubber masks, and we'd wear them all day, and and we'd be 
I had this job as a apartment maintenance man, so all I had to do was fix plumbing on 90-year-old apartments and you know fix the le electrical stuff and and. Um, then I had nothing to do for the rest of the day. So Jerry and I and, and Bob sometimes, we'd, we'd wear these masks and we'd be characters for a whole day and he'd be uh, different, a whole range of different people he liked to be in. And I kind of always gravitated towards being Boogie Boy, who was the infantile spirit of de-evolution. And then when we play, even to this day, which hopefully they're all done, all the Devo shows are hopefully over as of last year, if, if I get my way. Um, uh, even to the last show, it's like every show we did, Boogie Boy would come on at the very end of the show and he would get to speak in tongues a little bit or he would tell a story or sing something that nobody in the band knew was going to happen, um, not even me, you know, and he would just get to do some little performance before the show was over and it, and it usually made it so that everybody was ready to leave after that. So, so it, it kind of served a, a double purpose, but... Um, did I make the story really, really long? Um, so, in many ways, that quality is, I think, throughout your work. Um, this idea of, um, like, something like the, the imperfect thing that is, um, like, for example, in the exhibition, the book we talk about, um, uh, you make musical instruments that are out, out of bird calls, say. So you take 150 bird calls that are, this doesn't work, that's what call it. Side. Um, so you take um, like 150 um, bird calls and you make an instrument out of that and then you compose for that instrument. Now, clearly if you just composed for a proper instrument with, you know, has the regular keys um, as say a piano um, then you would get something that sounds relatively uniform but you always want to compose for a mutant instrument for something that's offbeat why is that uh, not always but but oh. it's but it's but that is something that I I like you know I there's all these Lucky for me, there's out there in the world, there's all these kids that do circuit bending. I don't know if anybody here knows what that is, but it's, it's usually, it's a kid who's, who's not getting along with his parents, and he goes down to the basement, and he takes one of his little sister's toys, like a Fisher-Price speak and spell, or he takes um, an Elmo doll, or he takes like a little Casio keyboard that's very benign and only makes really kitschy sounds, and they change the circuitry in it, and the speaking spells become incredible because they they're they're uncontrollable to a certain extent. You can you can adjust things and dial them in, but it's 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 a chaos machine where where instead of saying hello, how are you today, it'll go midumba. It's, so it's like speaking in tongues, and I became really attracted to. And these kids, they they'd make them, and then I don't know. Some of them make music with it. They're, for some reason, they just seem to be happy. And there's hundreds of these kind of kids out there. And they seem to be happy just to make this mutant instrument that makes these strange sounds. And they just make a demo tape where they don't even let you see them. You only see their hands and you see the instrument. And then they put it for sale on eBay for like five bucks or, or 500 bucks, depending on, you know, what they feel they can get for it. And um, I love those instruments. But but I also make my own, he's right. Uh, the bird call, I made this instrument out of bird calls. It's at uh, Adam's Museum right now. And it makes a beautiful sound throughout the building, doesn't it? It's very beautiful, yes. And, but, but it's, but I, it was, um, I was, Wes Anderson sent me this, this, some footage for a movie that I, I helped him with called, um, uh, Moonrise Kingdom. Thank you. And um, yeah, <laughs> and um, he sent me this this film of the kids when they first escape from um, the camp and they, they run away together, the boy and the girl. And there was this beautiful footage of a long shot of these kids running through the woods. And the, he didn't send me any dialogue or sound or anything to it. And it was just this quiet piece of film. And I was thinking that's so weird without you know hearing anything natural. And I have I collect instruments like some of them are electronic like the uh 
like we just talked about and some some of them are just like stray wooden organ pipes because people are decommissioning pipe organs all around the world and they're taking the pipes and sawing them up to make them into planters and stuff and it's freaking me out so so for a while I, I would buy them whenever I could find them on eBay and and uh, I was collecting just just random orphan pipes you know from different organs from you know like Australia or Europe or or North America and um, and I put them all together into one organ that that uh, that you don't have every note on an 88 note keyboard and you don't have I mean every pitch and, and you have doubles of some and you have some that are like microtonally close to each other and if you hit the two together it's kind of a crazy sound and so but but the bird calls I started playing with them for Wes's movie and then I lost interest in his movie and I just wanted to make music for bird calls for a while and um, but it's like it gets to be kind of problematic because what do you do give like 25 musicians each four bird calls and they're gonna like hold them all and and somehow you'll write music and they know when to do it and to get 25 people to do it all the time would be impossible and really expensive and so I found this guy in Northern California that repairs uh, calliopes and orchestrions for amusement parks and I convinced him into helping me uh, make an instrument that would play all these bird calls and uh, we did and um, and it doesn't really sound like birds. Some of it sounds a little bit like, almost like you're, you walked into a bird shop, but then it's, you can write things that are organized enough that birds would listen to it and go, I don't know what that is, you know? <laughs> and um, I kind of like having things other than, like since I compose, he told you a number that's pretty accurate for how many TV shows and films I've scored. And so, so I, you know, it's like you kind of, you got 88 notes in front of you, you know, on a keyboard and you're looking for something different. And sometimes when you have a different palette, you know, it's like, like if you're a painter, it's like finding a color that you never saw before, you know, and being able to use that mixed in with what you're doing. And um, that's, that's my attraction to that kind of stuff. Um. So uh, I'm going uh, off road here a little bit. Mark Quidner uh, actually talked about this, um, but <laughs> um, in public. But I, I want to ask you then. So you you've <laughs> what you describe everything here was something about like uh, you as this maker that's really n um, trying to put aside the rational part of your brain, and. Um, I'm wondering, and, and, and then uh, when you formed Devo, um, you're with Jerry Casale. You formed it, you know, in many ways. You co for you co organized it with him, um, and he was. Is, is it accurate to say that sort of he was the intellectual, and you were the sort of the maker, the the the, the more intuitive force within that collaboration? Yeah, we we were a complementary team at our best. You know, it's like uh, um, we each supplied something that that you know I got to be crazy and I got to be an uh, the mad scientist and he would explain it and uh, and organize it and um, it worked for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um. So uh, we have just uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to the audience um, pretty soon. But I just want to ask you: um, a little, you mentioned you talk a little bit about the exhibition that we have up at the museum right now, and just this is a retrospective exhibition. It's traveling around the country, and it'll be in New York. It'll be at the uh, Gray Art Gallery at NYU in 2017, when New York will be um, like knee high in water from the melting of the polar ice caps. But um, um, but in this exhibition, when we first ta started talking about doing an exhibition in 2011, um, you, you had uh, about 150 small exhibitions at that time around the country and the world um, of your individual bodies of artwork, but there, you, you hadn't yet had a sort of survey. Uh, you hadn't yet told your, your whole story you know, from before Devo through um, to today. So can I ask you, um, 
then how has it affect, affected you to have now this book um, and uh, a survey exhibition of your work, your life work to date? Well, nobody takes me seriously as a composer any longer in <laughs> Los Angeles, but um, uh, no, it's, it's, it was kind of when I first uh, saw it, it was kind of, um, I, I, there's things in, this, in the show that, that I had never intended to really be, I thought they would never be seen in the public because I, I draw every day and I write things that are a diary. I make them on, uh, because of my myopia, I, I draw it on sizes that are this big that I can hold perspective really easy. And um, it's like, I don't work out ever, but I do, and I, I never am good with my diet. M uh, my wife says I eat like a teenager, but um, uh, I do draw every day and, er and er probably every night also I get up and, and I do that and I write things that I remember from the day that freaked me out or, or inspired me or, or uh, I hated. And, and, and I just thought it was, and nobody, uh, you know, like girlfriends through my life, they would be curious like for the first um, couple weeks and then they'd lose interest. They'd just go, oh, okay, so he's part autistic or something, you know, they, they would, and then they would never look at him. And so I got used to people, you know, not paying attention to him and they were my, so I could be very private in them and I could be very frank and, and unlike art that it, when you're making art and you know it's going to go on the wall somewhere, you're conscious about it, you know, you think about that. And um, so this was all art that I had never, you know, I would pick things out and like we would find something that we would say, oh, that could be the freedom of choice cover, uh, like an idea for it, or that could be an idea for something that the Devo was doing, you know, and, and we'd, we'd, use, we'd use it out of this um, image bank. But um, it was kind of weird. I went to walk into a room and there were these books um, that hold a hundred of these cards in them that date back to 1972 and there were like 300 and some books uh, we put them out so it kind of looks like you're a, like it could be a display at Guantanamo Bay or something because they because they're on these low these low uh, tables that are very you know you have to kind of bend over to see them and there's like like all of them in one place. I'm used to look. I was used to looking at them on bookshelves at, at you know at my s studio where nobody ever paid attention. So to have them all sitting there open and strangers walking up and looking at them kind of made me nervous at first. So that's it. So having an exhibition makes you feel nervous. <laughs> no, it, it, yeah, but no, but. Well, it was kind of nice to s to it's see okay. everything. I'm, I'm just teasing you, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> Quit it. That was very nice. <laughs> Quit it. <laughs> um, I think you got the caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's let's turn it over to the audience. I think that they're probably do much better than me. Does anybody have any questions? All right, bring to the back. If there's no questions, we can just go now. Oh, there, oh, there's a question. <laughs> I have a question. Um, did the world devolve in the end? Well, you know, um, 35 years ago, I would ask that question from stage and maybe get hit in the head with a paper cup full of beer. But um, now you say it and everybody's like, hell yeah! <laughs> you know, everybody kind of agrees. I, and I think it devolved faster than I thought it was going to. on this side over here. Uh-oh. Somebody else is in control. Hi. Um, I was actually just at Denver, and me and my wife went through your exhibit. It was amazing. Wait, hold on. Did you go to Denver for this exhibition? No, we have family oh. out there. Oh. But <laughs> she was, uh, uh, we're both big Devo fans, and she was like, oh, his exhibit's there, so you need to tell, we totally need to go see it, which we did. Like a and little bit of that. Yeah, okay. we were there for Oh, like, oh, good, we're going to Denver because it's a show. That's why she, they went to the museum. Oh, okay. That's yeah. Good. Okay, we got that. They wouldn't okay. have just gone to Denver. Yeah, here. we went to go see family, too. <laughs> um... But on the lower level, we did notice that you got you have a live video show of a Devo concert, and um, one of the things I'm curious is going into a show and being an artist, and I'm sure everybody else in the band had creative input and things like that. How much um, 
did you guys have to compromise a little bit when putting together a show? Because going from album to album, um, from you know, Are We Not Men to you know, New Traditionalists and so on and so forth, you had different looks for every album. Did you guys kind of have to sit in a room and figure things out? If did you come in and be like, I have this great idea, we could all wear, you know fake hats or something like that and then somebody was like no I'm not into that or how much did the band kind of have to work together to come up with an image you know um, it was two sets of brothers basically and, and a drummer who did what we told him to do <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we were used to compromising and I think to, if you're if any of us in the band are truly honest about it uh, there's a lot of songs that might just say Chaka Homo by Mark Mothersbaugh or Mongoloid by Jerry Casale. But the reality is, is that we, um, Jerry and I were the major songwriters. My brother was like, kind of had it weighed in, you know, like a, a little lighter in, in the writing. Uh, but, um, and Jerry and I were both graphic design and fine art majors. So we, we were pretty much the ones who did most of the graphics. Bob Mothersbaugh did something with, to where he ended up of all things collaborating with Philippe Stark on on one of our records for some artwork but um, you know it's like w we we s we split up our publishing uh, so that everybody got a piece no matter what so that it wasn't like this like being in the Elvis Costello band or the or um, the David Bowie band or being in um, even talking heads you know where one person's getting the lion's share of all the the royalties and everything we we split it up so that so that everybody got something so it kind of encouraged everybody to to participate and i think our best stuff was when we were all getting along which is you know it's hard in a band you know you know anybody here married if you you know you know what it's like to be married to one person but imagine if it's four other people and they're the same sex you know and <laughs> or or at least the wrong sex you know so whatever whatever you know so so you know it's um you know we had our best times and we had things where it worked better than others you know but everybody really had something to do with it and and you know it's like one of my favorite songs that the band did was the only one that Bob Casale really kind of uh, was the germinating seed for and it was we were freezing and we were rehearsing in a um uh, a, a car wash that was, you know, closed for the winter, you know, why would you have a car wash open in the winter? Uh, and we, we were in the cinder block, um, uh, like the storage shed, and we, they were letting us rehearse there for free. And uh, we were freezing, everybody had gloves and coats on, and he started doing this little little kind of nervous picky thing, and uh, Alan started playing this kind of strange drum beat to it, and um, by the time it got around to singing, I, I started singing uh, Satisfaction, kind of backwards to the beat. And um, it made us, we were freezing, but it made us all laugh. We all had fun doing it. So, you know, everybody, everybody, you know, at some time or another contributed something. And I think Bob might have, you know, that being, if that was your only song you did for Devo, that's kind of a cool one to, to uh, have started off. Another one over here. Hi, Mark. Um, I just wanted to go back to the, when you were at Kent State and just wondering if you had any relationship to the political student groups at the time. With? The political student groups at the time. Well, you know, um, um, you know, it's like grades K through 12 for me, I was, l t I don't know, I was the, like I had a, a kick me thing on my back my whole you know, public school years, and I hated school, and um, I, I went to college because I'm like, I can't shoot anybody, you know, and I'm watching it on TV, and I'm saying, I know there's people that can do it, and, but I, there's, I can't think of anybody, any of the people that I see in the, in the news at night, there's none of them do I, do I hate, and do I want to kill, and, um, and I, I just thought, I don't know what to do, and then I, by some miracle, um, a, a high school teacher put me up for a, a partial scholarship at Kent State. They used to give out these things a long time ago for kids that weren't going to, you know, were probably not going to go to college, but maybe this would entice them to give it a try. And so I got this little partial scholarship in the for art. 
and went and it was a whole different world. I was like I wasn't the uh, the kid with the kick me sign anymore. And I remember I let my I got to let my hair grow and I was I was loving being at school and one day, you know, and there was always these political things going on, you know, everything from the Razi, you know, trying to uh, you know, enlist people to, you know, the yippies and all and and, and one day the yippies were driving around with a megaphone uh, or hanging out with a megaphone at the student union saying, watch us napalm a dog at noon. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I, I was shocked by that and I thought, well, I gotta check this out. So I went, so I went to where they, they had this set up and, and um, it was, uh, they had this dog on this table shivering. It was frightened, it was like so sad looking and uh, they had this cardboard box with, you know, some napalm, and they, they gave this talk. They said, well, we want you to see this, because we want you to see what happens when napalm touches the flesh of a living organism. And they talked about it, they described it, how napalm, when it touches flesh, it keeps burning, and it doesn't stop. It burns, and it's very, very successful at burning its way through inside to the internal organs and and you know even just a little bit can kill uh, uh, the enemy or whoever you're you know hopefully you're using it on the enemy if you're going to use it on anybody I guess but um, and w I was watching you know on TV these bombs tumble out of uh, I guess b-52s they must have used back then and you'd see you know you'd be over a forest and you'd see these bombs tumbling and they'd say it, it was either agent orange or then they would have napalm and you'd watch it and then and then they showed pictures of little kids there were these little kids coming down some road and this little girl I don't know if you remember uh, that it was kind of a famous photo where her clothes are burnt off and she's like ah she's got burn marks all over her and you don't and I don't think you know if she lives or dies um, I'm not sure but I remember but anyhow so they had photos like that and they they and they go um, okay we're so they're getting ready to do it and they go who here is gonna stop us and everybody goes I'm gonna and then um, they go well if you are going to stop us from doing this to a dog, why are you letting us, our government do it to thousands and thousands of people in Cambodia and Vietnam? And I said, okay, I'm signing up. So I signed up for SDS that day. And um, like a couple days later, I was part of a march where I was at the front of the line and, and we went down to the, to the ROTC, I mean to the um, Army Enlistment Center and Somebody was out in front and they start talking and then all of a sudden rocks are going over my head and I'm like, boy, this is pretty serious. And, and you know, they were breaking windows and then that's when then National Guard came in the next day and then um, a ROTC building got burnt down and then I think it was the very next day we were, we were at campus and all of a sudden uh, the shooting happened and they closed the school down. And so because of the school closing, um, uh, Jerry started coming over to my house because we were visual artists that had collaborated together but we also were musicians and since we couldn't work at school where we had a had studios we he just came over to my place and we played music and that's when we decided that we were observing de-evolution not evolution yeah one more sorry this is the last one for the night is that is that what Auto Modown's about? Auto Modown was about um, there was a there was a um, an auto accident in Youngstown, and it was in the Kent State paper. We were looking at this picture, and um, the photographer had taken a picture of a corn. It's it's Auto Modown, noon in downtown. Bodies got the blues. Um, bodies without shoes. And then, but anyhow, the, the, we, there was a photo in the newspaper of three pairs of shoes that some they'd got hit so hard that the shoes stayed right where they were standing and and uh, some kid that was doing acid had run them over and and so that's what that song was about <laughs> it, if, if we would have uh, you know worked for the local news we could have done one every night for the news but <laughs> We are unfortunately out of time for tonight's program, but let's give a big round of applause to Mark and Adam for joining us tonight. I would like to invite everyone to help themselves to a couple volumes. Thank you for coming tonight.
Definitely. <laughs> Go for the things on the high shelves. <laughs>